Hello. Today, in this clip, I will describe to you what happens on a molecular basis at the interface between a leaf which is being attacked by a pathogen and the pathogen. So again, I will use the example of one cell in a leaf. I will draw it as square, which is almost always the case. Also maximizes my use of the available screen. So when you have these cells packed together, let's assume that you have several of them. You have a situation where the cell is liquid and is contained by a membrane, a plasma membrane, which is a, a lipid bilayer. So it has water-soluble heads and fat-soluble tails. It is extremely narrow, uh, 20 nanometers maybe, I, that might, that may or may not be an accurate figure. But if you've seen any of my protoplast pictures, if you have a cell which is only bound by a membrane, it is perfectly round because the fluid inside the cell is pushing out with equal force in all directions. Now, in planta, the cell is bound by a cell wall, which is uh, constructed of cellulose and hemicellulose, and the, uh, those are fibers that are embedded in a, uh, a gel of pectin. And um, that gives the plant its structure and uh, allows a turgor pressure to build so that um, <coughs> the plant is able to push water through cells along a stem or a branch or a root towards cells which are growing, which do not have a rigid cell wall and so are not under pressure. So if you create a vacuum in one of those cells, if you relax a cell wall, then the pressure in this will cause that other cell to grow. However, let's assume for a moment that we are dealing with a mature cell that is a constant size and volume. So you have a filament, an oomycete filament, which is weaving its way among these cells and trying to find a point of entry so that it can um, feed itself and parasitize, uh, parasitize the, the, plant, the plant tissue. So the way it does this is by making a specialized structure called a hostoria. Which I expect is a Germanic word, and I'm not sure what it means. But that hostoria is a structure, if I can figure out how I might put a, uh, a microscope image here, and this hostoria penetrates the cell wall uh, through, through some different mechanisms, but does not penetrate the membrane. So you have this microscopically thin membrane, which is inside the cell wall, and then invaginates around the hostoria. So you have this fairly large surface area of a very intimate connection between the fungal hostoria and the plant membrane. And so at this point, or before this point, several things are happening. So one is that the plant has a nucleus. It's not necessarily something that's happening, this is something that is, which has chromosomes which are all jumbled up, made of genes, and then there's a large number of proteins that are affecting the uh, way that those genes are being transcribed and that affects how the, 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 the cell reacts to its environment and this multiplied 
millions of times determines the behavior of the plant as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an organism. So the cell would prefer to not be eaten alive by fungi. Um, and so it's developed over billions of, of years uh, a system to detect when this is happening and um, a way to, 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 uh, to, uh, to avoid it, to minimize it, to, to maintain a, a, a beneficial balance between growth and defense. Um, the more the plant, the more energy the plant dedicates to building itself, the less energy it has to defend itself against, against parasites. And vice versa, the more time and energy it spends not being eaten alive, the less ability it has to build itself and reproduce itself and, and, and propagate, um, colonize uh, an ecological niche. And so this plant, all the other plants of this species and all the other plants of all the other species are all trying to do this simultaneously. And each one is performing a, a um, multivariate calculation as far as what's the best balance of defense and growth based on the quantity and quality of pathogens that are, that are present, many other environmental factors. But this is typically studied in a simplified environment with abundant light and water and nutrients and a single pathogen and a single, a single plant. So it's, uh, it's a way to take a look at a, a, a thin slice of a large number of competitive and collaborative interactions that add up to, to, to evolution. So, the first line of defense that a plant has is typically called PTI, pathogen triggered immunity. And here it's worth noting that most plants are resistant to most pathogens. Um, Bremia lactuque is named because it only colonizes lettuce, I think. There are other oomycetes that, um, that, that can colonize hundreds of, of, of plant species, but it's quite rare for, for a pathogen to colonize thousands of plant species. Usually it's a very targeted range that it's able to successfully um, uh, uh, colonize. And so uh, it kind of opens this interesting possibility that plant pathology may, in fact, be a solvable problem. Once you find out what Sobremia lactuque can it infect lettuce, which means that it cannot infect 99.9999% of, of plants. And if we can find out what those plants are doing that lettuce is not doing, we might be able to uh, extirpate Bremia lactuque from, from, from the ecosystem. And if you could do that for one pathogen, you could do that for, for, for any pathogen. So this first layer of defense typically takes place at the cell membrane. And I may be able to illustrate it thusly. So at the membrane, um, the, the plant has uh, these receptors. And these receptors are, um, have a domain on the outside of the membrane and the inside of the membrane. And the outside of the membrane is the uh, sensor portion, and the inside is the signaling portion. And one commonality is that, that's too small, uh, a leucine rich repeat. And uh, the, the, the actual molecular interactions between these proteins and the, the, the fungal proteins is extremely difficult to study. But we have noticed that leucine rich repeats are the part of the protein. In, in some cases, it's the, to, a, to a first order of approximation, it's the LRR that provides specificity for the protein, the plant protein, to sense the fungal protein. And then on the inside, there's a transmembrane domain that, that holds um, 
the protein in the membrane. This part is water soluble, and this part is water soluble. The bit in the middle is, is fat soluble, so that it, it sits here. And then you have a signaling domain on the inside. And so that signaling domain uh, later is able to uh, signal to the nucleus that there's a, uh, uh, an attack. Typically, the signal is not specific. The signal is not, we're under attack by Bremia lac 2 k uh, a, a4. It's just a, uh, a, a signal. There's a pathogen. We're being eaten alive. Let's, let's do something about it. And in this case, typically, there's uh, a number of, a number of uh, uh, generalized uh, defense responses. Um, there's transcriptional responses, a large number of them. There's a core set of about uh, 1,100 genes that are upregulated in response to attack by any pathogen. And uh, the result uh, frequently is a thickening of the cell wall via callose deposition which makes it more difficult for the, uh, the fungus to enter. There's um, reactive oxygen species forming, such as peroxide, uh, which might have a structure like, like this. It's been a while since I've um, looked at the, uh, the chemistry of that. And peroxide in nature is um, uh, like in, in the peroxide you get from the drugstore, is able to react nonspecifically and degrade a wide range of, 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 of substances. It's a, it's a very reactive molecule. These oxygens do not like being bound to each other and to, to hydrogen, so it's, it, it can react with, with various parts of the fungi or uh, to an insect, an insect's digestive system, and um, reduce the intensity of the, of the, of the attack. Um, there's also calcium signaling that takes place which can interact with a wide variety of uh, hormone systems um, downstream, whether it's jasmonic acid, salicylic acid, um, those are probably the two big ones, uh, ethylene, and then um, the transcription affects and is affected by, by those, those, uh, those factors as well. So that's what happens as a result of this signal traveling to the nucleus and also to the cytosol. Some of these um, uh, uh, reaction modules are pre-existing in the cytosol in an inactive form so that when an attack takes place, you don't have to wait for the signal to get to the nucleus, transcription, translation, post-translational modification, and so on. The parts are pre-existing in the, um, it's a, a, a TIE fighter protein, um, in, in the cell, and uh, uh, um, that response is, is quicker on a scale of perhaps minutes instead of, instead of hours. Um, but, you know, being at the, the, the genome center, we tend to focus on what happens with the genome, and this, this field is um, outside of my wheelhouse. So, you're probably wondering how this cell senses this fungus, how this protein, this receptor senses this fungus. And this, typically, you have many types of these, but typically they respond to molecules that are common to broad classes of, of, of pathogens. So in the case of fungi, um, I don't actually know the names of these, uh, these, uh, these, these, uh, these molecules offhand. Um, uh, I will give you an example from a, from a bacteria. So this is a, a Hostoria. A bacteria has, a, you might say, a more elegant structure called the type 3 secretory system. And actually, I will hold off on that for now. So um, I think one of the one of the one of the fungal uh, PAMPs. So PTI is best at detecting pathogen-associated molecular patterns.
So at this point, it's a test. I'm going to turn off the lights. So these PAMPs um, are molecules that the pathogen requires for its primary metabolism. For 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 uh, simply existing, it must make these molecules, and therefore it's not able to to not make them in order to to uh, to avoid uh, setting off this alarm system. So in the case of bacteria, there's a couple of well-known ones that are the 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 the, the models. One is uh, flagellin, which is uh, a component of the um, flagella that bacteria use to uh, to get around, and it's been found that there's an epitope or a part of the flagellin protein called FLS22, which is 22 amino acids that is that elicits a um, a PTI response. So uh, let's assume for a moment that the the, the fungus is also uh, uh, shedding uh, flagellin as it as it as it does this process. That's a bit nonsensical if you were to look at the actual structure of this, but just uh, bear with me for a moment. Uh, the flagellin is shed at the interface, so it's not necessarily it's. It's not entering the cell. It's not necessary for it to enter the cell. It's something that the cell senses is happening between its membrane and the cell wall. Um, and so you have a bacteria that has lost, uh, lost, lost, lost its flagella. Uh, these LRR are able to sense the flagella, and then at that point. The sensation of FLS22, of flagellin, causes these to dimerize. And typically, I think for, for almost all cases, there's a common adapter, which is called BAC1. And it's interesting that it's common, because the LRRs are highly specific. So here is, what is that called? Uh, the flagellin receptor, which I should probably know, is specific for flagellin. And then other PAMPs have other specific receptors, all of them dimerize with uh, BAC1 to create this, this signal that then, um, that then uh, transduces to the nucleus. So, it looks like I might be out of space here, so I will, uh, I will um, have a new video to zoom in on the nature of this interaction itself and what happens between sensation and transcription, how that varies how it can be manipulated, and what the pathogen does to short circuit that, that uh, signaling cascade to avoid having these thicker cell walls and peroxide and calcium signaling and a generalized defense response. So thank you very much for watching.